Sunday, February 11, 2024. I'm Anthony Davis. Welcome to The Weekend Show, where we make the time to consider the news of the week. You can support my work and independent journalism at patreon.com slash five minute news. Our guest today is the former president and CEO of the NAACP, a civil rights attorney, an ordained minister and professor of the practice of public leadership and social justice at Harvard, Professor Cornell William Brooks. Welcome back to The Weekend Show. It is a delight to be with you. Uh, great to be back on the show and certainly great to be with you. Thank you. We we have we have so much to to discuss. I, I feel like there's like six months of news has happened in the, in the last week, and uh, now that the Supreme Court is got involved in Donald Trump's, uh, you know, the whole kind of insurrection argument. Interestingly, he actually came out after his lawyers had been arguing that you know there the, he wasn't an insurrectionist. He actually came out and publicly s- admitted that there was an insurrection and blame Nancy Pelosi for it, but use the word insurrection twice. So, um, you know, we know that he's very good at blowing up his own case. But I, I want to talk about uh, a couple of tweets that you posted, because Clarence Thomas on the Supreme Court is questionable whether he should recruit, recuse himself, because, of course, there is plenty of evidence to suggest that his wife was intrinsically involved in the, in the insurrection itself. You posted, as Clarence Thomas listens to arguments today, we watch the court's credibility go from low to zero. Court trust sinks as authoritarian acceptances rise. You said now less than 50% of Americans trust the court and nearly 75% of Republicans think Trump being dictator for a day is good. How did we get here, Professor? Yeah. The, the road to the present moment was and is perilous and it is a road literally if not of our creation meaning the whole of the country certainly is the creation of a group of americans who really lost sight of what this country is about here's what i mean clarence thomas taking a seat on the supreme court was the project of the the federalist society That is to say, to place someone on the court who reflected the values and views of the Federalist Society. But in so doing, with this this solitary, single-minded devotion to putting essentially a jurisprudential ideologue on the court, um, power it by any means necessary, a, a kind of judicial power grab that we have on the court someone who is literally uh, an ideologue. But what makes it worse? An ideologue who's operated in an ethics free zone. Can we imagine a member of Congress? Can we imagine uh, a governor? Can we imagine someone on the local city council literally taking wildly expensive, luxurious trips, acting on matters that benefit their donors? And then insisting that they're not subject um, to any ethical guidelines, any any ethical prescriptions, uh, that they literally operate above the rule of law. But the problem here is this is a member of the Supreme Court. So here we have someone whose wife literally organized, at a minimum, organized the transportation of insurrectionists to the Capitol who promoted the insurrection. Now, most justices on the Supreme Court, I would like to believe it, would acknowledge the appearance of of conflict of interest is obvious. But here we have a substantive conflict of interest, uh, not only retrospectively, i.e. she was involved in the insurrection, but prospectively, meaning if her husband votes to keep Donald Trump on the ballot, she will benefit as a lobbyist. And so the the, the conflict is is both retrospective with respect to the past, prospective with respect to the present and the future, and all of it represents a, a, a moment of delegitimacy, right? Because the country can't trust the court. And this is like, this is very serious. And the reason it's very serious is because 
I would not be in conversation with you today were not for the Supreme Court of the 1950s and 1960s and 70s uh, and the decades since who have upheld major civil rights legislation in, in civil rights statutes. The Supreme Court has been the bulwark uh, in this democracy. So to have literally members of the Supreme Court uh, robed in black, sitting in this white marble castle that children from Iowa and South Carolina and California take school buses to see, to see them literally uh, uh, in, a, in a mud pit, in a mud pit of, 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 of tainted ethics, is just really disturbing. Right? I mean, members of the Supreme Court taking gifts, taking money. I mean, you know, this yeah. is just unseemly. Like, the, the relationship with Harlan, with Harlan Crow, the, and also the fact that the court has self-regulated until this point. And, and the fact that, I mean, it reminded me a little bit of Boeing and the FAA, you know, the FAA saying, oh, you just, you've got this, you, you, right. you know, you're a good American company. You're not going to cause any trouble. You self-regulate, save us the trouble. <laughs> and it's the same with the court, isn't it? It's, it's like the idea that whereas every other court has to follow guidelines. That's right. Is it because that fundamentally these individuals on the court are political appointees, which really makes them politicians? You know, that they wear their stripes on their, on their sleeve. They are, they are actually politicians. They're not impartial judges, are they? Well, but here's the thing. Every other member of the federal judiciary is a political appointee too. Federal District Court judges, judges on the U.S. Court of Appeals, as well as the Supreme Court, are all appointed um, and named by the president and confirmed by the Senate. Here what we have is not little politicians. You could argue that many judges are at least political enough to be appointed. What we have here is political judicial appointees who run amok. Okay? Yeah. Because, let me put it this way, if you were to ask the average federal district court judge or judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals, can I consort with donors, take gifts, have my mother live in a house that they paid for, and then uh, rent, rent it back and remain a member of the federal judiciary, there's not a judge in America who, 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 who would claim that you could possibly get away with that. So this is, this is really, I, I would argue, um, a little different. This is a matter of a toxic mix of privilege and arrogance, right? Because they've gotten used to doing something that they know is wrong. Like, they, like let me put this way, and here's how we know that. If any other federal judge were to do what they did, they would not hesitate in affirming, upholding any decision relative to them being kicked off the bench. Right? There's no question, to, question about that. But unfortunately, and, and I, don't, I don't want to say this categorically, like not every member of the court, but it appears that at least some members of the court are so arrogant so privileged that they don't even see how bad this is. Like Justice Roberts, I do think the Chief Justice has some sense this, that this at least looks bad. Like yeah. he's made attempts to engage in some measure of reputational redemption. But it, it, it is an institution run amok when you literally have Justice Alito and Justice Thomas essentially saying, well, you know, you may be having an anxiety attack about America's concern about uh, Supreme Court ethics, but we're not bothered by it and we're yeah. not going anywhere. Yeah, because there is no one above them. And, and, and isn't that the point that there is no, you know, we'd call it a line manager these days. You know, there is, <laughs> there is no, nobody to, to report to. But should we, should we not also talk a little about the, the bias that we heard in the debate from the Supreme Court? Because, mm -hmm. you know, I, I listened as you did to much of the, the arguments, and it did seem that whenever the subject of Donald Trump being an insurrectionist came up, 
whether it was Neil Gorsuch or Brett Kavanaugh, they would redirect the conversation towards some kind of framers, you know, something from, you know, 1876. And I was like, wow, like this is so blatant. You don't have to be a genius to hear that there is an intrinsic bias in their, in their decision to redirect the conversation. And, you know, this is, this is injustice. We, we were hearing injustice in real time. And, you know, I wouldn't expect the court to be partisan. I wouldn't expect the court to use irresponsible, reckless adjectives applied to the former president. But I would expect the Supreme Court a court above appellate courts, a court above district courts, above trial courts, to respect the finding of a trial court in Colorado. So the point right. being here is this is not a matter of being a Republican or a Democrat. It's not a matter of, of being disrespectful to a former president. But we literally have a trial court that has held that the former president was an insurrectionist. Though they may not have been comfortable using that term, it would not have been wrong for any of the conservative justices to simply say the trial court trial court has found that the former president engaged in insurrection. That's a matter of fact. That's, it's not an ad hominem attack. It's not disparaging the former president. It's not uh, diminishing the stature of the presidency. It is a matter of taking note of the facts. Yeah. And so I, I think you're right here to the extent that those facts were not acknowledged. Um, calls well, where I'm from, it, it probably would never have gone to the high court because we watched the insurrection on television. So, the, you know, in, in the UK, just anecdotally, I would say it would never have needed to go to court because the evidence we could see with our own eyes and we watched it live. Mm -hmm. So what were you going to argue that he is or isn't an, ex an insurrectionist when the guy's on stage saying, let's go to the Capitol, I'll go with you. You've got to fight like hell or you're not going to have a country anymore. I mean, which bit is him not being an insurrectionist? And also they tried to make the argument that it wasn't planned. And yet we have evidence, of course, that this coup, starting with the fake electors scheme, was meticulously planned. The, the, the riot only happened as a last-ditch attempt to, to get Mike Pence to do some dirty work. So it, it's like living in a parallel universe where it's like their, their version of reality, maybe alternative facts, call it what you will, but we, we watched it. So why is it even in the court? Well, Anthony, here's, here are a couple of things that I, I think are worth noting in terms of what you just lifted up. When did we import into the definition of an insurrection a degree of organization? Like in other words, why, why do you have to have a PhD in logistics and organization in order to be successful, to be defined in insurrections, right? So in other yeah. words, is it possible to be an incompetent insurrectionist and still be an insurrectionist as opposed to a well-organized, thoughtful, careful uh, insurrectionist? First point. Second point is, with respect to what, what we all saw on television, here's the, here's the thing that's, I, I think, also interesting. Because you, you juxtapose the Brits with, with America. If I'm not mistaken, America has more cameras the largest media industry of any country anywhere in the world. We are literally awash in audio and video, right? And yet there are moments when we seem to be the, the most disbelieving, right? In other words, we, we, put, we put cameras in cars to capture police homicides, and then we choose to disbelieve what it is in fact we see. Yeah. Here we have probably the, the best and most widely recorded insurrection in, in global history. And yet we are still having a debate about what, what we all saw. Now, if you ask me to explain why we as Americans have suffered this particular challenge, I don't know. But I do know it's, 
it is it is confounding. Is it exceptionalism? The idea that you know it couldn't happen here. Um, the idea of the government being overthrown by the by the the president. That's the stuff that happens in shithole countries, to coin a phrase. You know what I mean? And 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 so the idea that um, because you know America, the great bastion of freedom, one of the great democracies, respected and 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 replicated all around the That's world. Right. That's right. And yet, it fell momentarily. And so, you know, maybe that disbelief is kind of baked into. The idea, it's a bit like, you know, if I use 9-11 as an example, people couldn't believe what they were seeing. Yes. It, it was a moment where it was, am I watching a movie or is this real life? Well, and seeing the Capitol overrun and, and attacked and police officers being attacked. I mean, for me, the guy being caught in the door was the most difficult thing to yeah. watch. And seeing him squeal in pain, I mean, it was... America makes disaster films very well for some reason. Love they love they love making these things. This was real life. Absolutely, I think you're absolutely right. It, it might be a combination of American exceptionalism, our own unrestrained idealism with respect to what we aspire to as a country, and our own image of our of ourselves. Right. In other words, it is hard to believe about ourselves what we that what we condemn in other countries could ever be true here. And so the idea that the American the U.S. capital could be taken over this massive lapse. Um, I wouldn't say lapse in security in the sense of police officers and the Capitol Police did their job, but they weren't allowed to do their job. Yeah, it was all, it was all set up so that the That's National right. Guard couldn't be, couldn't be right. activated. We, we have all the paperwork for that. That's right. And, and, and I, I think Americans, and certainly I, I, I would have to confess here, I, I found it difficult to believe that before and afterwards that so many would capitulate with respect to these insurrections, like, and, 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 and I, 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 I mean this as, as, as somebody who's not politically naive, but politically hopeful. It was shocking to me that whether you had a D or an R beside your name, that you would go so far in support of your party or your party's nominee that you would literally stand against the people who were guarding the House. Right. And that you would literally turn over the house of democracy and you'd have people literally urinating, defecating in the people's house. I mean, like, yeah. I never met anyone who's visited the Capitol who was not in awe of the building. Like, the, the, the building, like, let me put this way. I'm a fourth generation minister in my church. I've studied church architecture. These temples that we deem to be sacred invoke a sense of awe. When you walk into the U.S. Capitol, it inspires a sense of awe. And not just awe in terms of architectural wonder, but literally idealism rendered, democracy ideals literally etched into stone, carved yeah. into statue. Yeah. And so the thing that members of Congress would allow hooligans insurrectionists that literally profane and desecrate the building and then take their side. I mean, that was hard to believe, right? Like, I, I, it was just absolutely shocking. So I, I think I, for a great many Americans, that was very difficult to accept. And it's easier to say that what we saw isn't as bad as what we saw or that it didn't happen at all, as in it cannot be, it can be characterized a great many things, but great many ways, but it cannot be characterized as its right. I fear that it was just the rehearsal for mm -hmm. next January. That's right. Because, you know, let's be clear, if Donald Trump is on the ballot and he doesn't win, he'll do exactly the same thing, claiming that it, it was fraudulent. And, and, and his, his army, they know what to do this time. It, 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 it could just be a, a repeat. It is. 
Anthony, I, I, I would note here that, and I've been saying this since the insurrection, that it is not a matter of historical histrionics or political alarmism to appreciate the fact that the insurrection was a trial run. The insurrection, at least from my, my perspective and professional opinion, was literally the opening chapter in an ongoing, slower moving civil war. I said this more than a year ago, that when you think about the start of the civil war in this country, in terms of the attack on Fort, Salt, Fort Sumter in Charleston, militarily speaking, it was not by any means an overwhelming success. The Confederate Army didn't have uni uh, uniforms. The Confederate Army was not uh, fully formed. Uh, there was no fighting force, if you will, uh, fully mobilized. The threat was not fully manifested. Like the insurrection, we had an attack on a symbol that sent a message. The former president has shown no compunction, no uh, guilt, anxiety, reservation about using violence, signaling violence, and being very clear that he intends to be a despot. Now, the country is almost evenly divided between those who choose to face history and the, and the basically the premonitions, and not premonitions, but the, namely, now, the almost pronouncements that are anything but prophetic, right? And the other half of the country that really takes a view that we're in danger. And we can't give up. You know, one half of the country can't give up on the other. But I'll put it this way. We can't be naive. This is absolutely the case. And we've seen it at every, every step of the way uh, in the intervening months that uh, we're in a perilous moment. I just want to go back to the judiciary for a moment, yeah. because there was a report out on uh, Friday that said that the man behind the conservative effort to move the judiciary to the right mm -hmm. has ties to many of the groups and people arguing that Donald Trump should stay on, on the ballot, case heard at the Supreme Court. It's Leonard Leo, uh, advocacy and financial network. His organization played a major role in, in Trump's judicial nominations and confirmation hearings as part of his years long push to make the courts more friendly to conservatives and to oh. their, and to their causes. Mm -hmm. um, Clarence Thomas once joked that Leo was the th number three most powerful person in the world. He's the co-chairman of, of the Federalist Society. That's right. This s separation of church and state, which people are starting to talk about again, I think for a while it was not spoken about, but, it's very much on people's lips now, partly because the new Speaker of the House is a, is a far-right Christian nationalist, Mike Johnson, mm -hmm. but also because we're seeing even on the Supreme Court, you know, Amy Coney Barrett, for example, mm -hmm. part of some very extreme mm -hmm. church. Mm -hmm. the, the, there is an argument from the right, including from Mike Johnson, there's video of him saying it, that there never was supposed to be a separation of church and state. Correct. That the founders very much involved the, 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 the church and the, the, the teachings of the Bible when they, you know, wrote the, 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 the paperwork that we still use today. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. What, what do you think about that? Um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a corruption of, of history. It's corruption of history and it's, and it's corruption of, of religion. And what I mean by that is if we think about the Declaration of Independence, baked into the Declaration of Independence is the Jewish idea, also borrowed by the Christians, also borrowed and practiced by Muslims, of the Imago Dei. That everyone's creating the image of God, and as a consequence, they have our rights, that they have innate dignity, worth, and value. This idea, while it sort of off as a, 
part of the Jewish tradition has been applied in so many different ways by so many different religious traditions baked into human rights instruments. What am I suggesting here? Is that religious values have certainly influenced the moral trajectory, the legal trajectory of the country. But the framers were very clear that our constitution prohibits the establishment of religion. And so what that means is you can say, uh, you know, some will say, well, you know, well, you can't separate uh, church and state, but to the extent you conflate church and state, and the state endeavors to create a church, you are literally in so doing destroying someone else's church, destroying someone else's temple, destroying someone else's mosque, and creating uh, neither theocracy or democracy, but in fact, a kind of uh, ideological aut autocracy. And so I'm simply, I, I, I've said this over many years, that as a fourth generation minister in my church, my grandfather was a minister, my great my great-grandfather, my great-great-grandfather, many of my uncles, many members of my family, I devoted my life to my religious vocation. But what would scare me almost more than anything is if my church were running the government. Why? Because we don't need anyone using government as an instrument for God. Because what we will certainly see is less God, right? Yeah. Um, and less of an uninhibited, unimpeded search for God and the godly and the divine and the sacred in what we deem a secular society. It is absolutely like I always tell people, you know, religious people need to be the first ones to fear theocracy. Right. Because the thing is, when you look at the, the founding of this country, we think about the Puritans, we think about the Quakers. We think about uh, my church came out of the Methodist Episcopal Church, which came out of the Anglican Church. So many religious traditions. I grew up in the South, not too far from where I grew up. Uh, the Reform Judaism movement was born. The point being is when you say you want to create a government that supports religion, whose religion? And do we freeze religion in a, in a certain time? I, I mean, it's, 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 I absolutely, it's absolutely frightening and it's a historical. Last point I'll make here is my, my home state of South Carolina in the 1700s was the most, was a student, it was a state that contained the largest number of Jewish people. Why? Because it had a liberal constitution that allowed for Christians, Jews, Muslims, and infidels, was language to that effect. Here's my point. When you open the doors for everyone, religion flourishes. When you close the doors, uh, conflate the state and, and the church, or the state and the mosque, or the state and the temple, generally speaking, religious people don't do too well in those circumstances. Yeah. Trump said, the other day when he was on a rally stage complaining about Democrats and Marxists and communists as he does and then migrants and they're coming and all this stuff he said they hate our religion and I uh, that really kind of stuck with me because we know that he's a fake Christian right we he can't quote Bible verse he's broken every sin <laughs> so so we, we know that he's just playing a long game to get the evangelical vote. It's, it's, you'll never be a scientist to work that bit out. But, you know, it's, what's unfortunate is that our religion with a lot of people, certainly a lot of MAGA Republicans, it means something. Because, you know, we spoke last time about, you know, this idea of, you know, MAGA making America white again. It's also making America white Christian and cis again. And, and it, it's becoming increasingly clear to people, and hopefully some people who would traditionally vote conservative, that that is a, a kind of untenable position in a modern world. So 
how do you feel when you hear the disgraced former president saying they hate our religion? Yeah, you know, I think about a couple of things. Whose religion and who, who, who constitutes our, right? So this book, which I read on a regular basis, um, in the Christian Bible, and many of the, of the traditionalists uh, have the words of Jesus underscored in red. Okay? But you need not be a Christian. All you need to do is read the, what the Christians call the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible, and you see the same thing. The prophets talk about extending aid to orphans, widows, the strangers among us, migrants, refugees, being kind and respectful to the elderly and the uh, infirm. And when we look at the people that the former president authorizes, these are the very people that Christians and Jews often prioritize, right? So in other words, the Bible is very clear about extending hospitality to the stranger. Right. So in other words, uh, it was considered a great moral offense to have someone show up in your land and you not extend to them hospitality. Hospitality meant shelter, food, water. So whether or not we like our immigration policy, if somebody shows up on your doorstep hungry, thirsty, ill clothed, ill housed, until you figure out your immigration policy, you may not like it, yeah. but our religious tradition tells us that we can't, we, can't re, we can't refuse to hear their human needs and respond to it. So give, give us your sick, give us your hungry. That's right. It, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a blessing. It's, it's, it's a blessing and it's a, it, is, it may be a hard thing for some people to hear. But as I like to remind people, rather than have the former president misquote your Bible, you read your Bible. <laughs> yeah. Right? Because last I heard, he is not a priest, a mom, uh, a rabbi, or a minister. You read it. And, and, you, and the thing is, you need not just read the Christian Bible. You, you read the Torah. Uh, you read the Quran. You hear similar things. But going beyond that, those folks in a humanist tradition have the same kinds of values. So that's one challenge. The other challenge here is the amount of anger and hatefulness and spitefulness and just vengeance that the former president spouts. Like, I, I'm just trying to figure out just a couple of things. If you really listen to President Trump on the way to your church, your mosque, your synagogue, by the time you get there, you're not going to be in a great mood to worship whatever God you worship. Right? Because it's just too, it's too emotionally and morally toxic. Okay? And, the, and, and the third point here is, and this is a really serious theological point, which is idolatry. Right? As much as I admire you, Anthony, my tradition tells me I can't put you above God. Right? And so it, it doesn't matter whether it's President Obama, uh, President Biden, or President Trump, or Secretary Hillary Clinton, none of these people or anybody else in this country, 350 million plus people, uh, is to be so exalted. And so the dangerous part of this moment is literally we have a, a kind of autocracy being proposed to the people under the guise of a theocracy, all of which results in a threat to a threat, results in a threat to our democracy. And that's the part of this which is really, really frightening because to the evangelicals, he promises the Christian nationalist theocracy. To those who want their form of capitalism, he promises them a kind of soft autocracy where you'll get the kind of court you want, you'll get the kind of Congress you want, you'll get the kind of state legislatures you want, and we'll make sure that you're able to make as much money as you want to the way you want to make it. And so this is like a very dangerous um, endeavor 
And I would hope that my evangelical friends and fellow citizens heed the warning. And then, Anthony, the last point I'll make on this is, you know, evangelicals come in all stripes, right? To the extent that the great commission in the Bible where it says that people are to, you know, go out and, and, and preach Jesus unto the nations, right? That's an evangelical call. Many churches, black churches, Latino churches, white churches, practice this, some form of evangelism. I think the challenge for us is when evangel, you know, uh, whether it be evangelicals, charismatics, conservatives, liberals, whatever your religious stripe is, where you make idolatry your religion. That's a problem. So you don't have to believe what I believe, but I'm just asking you to believe what you say you believe. I, I want to talk on this subject. I want to talk about the Heritage Foundation's plan for Project 2025 in, and, and also the indoctrination that kind of goes with that in just a moment. We have to take a quick pause for our sponsor, but we'll come back with Professor Cornell William Brooks. I've always found it difficult to find clothes that I like to wear. And when I find one thing that works, I just buy loads of them and just wear the same thing all the time. Well, men's closets were due for a radical reinvention. And Roan stepped up to the challenge. Roan's commuter collection is the most comfortable, breathable and flexible set of products known to man. And here's why. Roan helps you get ready for any occasion. The commuter collection offers the world's most comfortable pants, dress shirts, zips and polos. You'll never have to worry about what to wear when you've got the Roan commuter collection. The comfortable four-way stretch fabric provides breathability and flexibility that leaves you free to enjoy what life throws your way from your commute to work or your 18 holes of golf. It's time to feel confident without the hassle. With Roan's wrinkle release technology, wrinkles disappear as you stretch and wear the products. It's that easy. And with Gold Fusion anti-odor technology, you'll be smelling fresh and clean all day long. And on top of that, Roan is 100% machine washable, so you can ditch the dry cleaner altogether. I personally love a technical fabric, something that is advanced and uses technology to make a more comfortable and more modern outfit. Now, the commuter collection can get you through any workday and straight into whatever comes next. So head to roan.com slash Anthony and use promo code Anthony to save 20% off your entire order. That's 20% off your entire order when you head to rhone.com slash Anthony and use code Anthony, A-N-T-H-O-N-Y. It's time to find your corner office comfort. So you're confident in the office, at the dinner table, or even on the dance floor, but can't keep it going when you get back to the bedroom. With HIMSS, you can get access to medications to ensure your erectile dysfunction gets treated, so you can keep the confidence going all day and all night. Hims is changing men's health care by providing access to affordable and discreet sexual health treatments, all from the comfort of of your couch. The process is simple, 100% online, no uncomfortable doctor's visits. Just answer a series of questions on the site and a medical provider will determine the right treatment option. If prescribed, your medication ships directly to you for free and in discreet packaging. Hims has hundreds of thousands of trusted subscribers, so if ED is getting you down, it's time to change that. Start your free online visit today at hymns.com slash weekend. That's H-I-M-S dot com slash weekend for your personalized ED treatment options. Hymns.com slash weekend. Prescriptions require an online consultation with a healthcare professional who will determine if appropriate. Restrictions apply. See website for details and important safety information. Subscription required. Price varies based on product and subscription plan. It's The Weekend Show. We're back with Professor Brooks. I'm Anthony Davis. Um, Project 2025 is something that you know, we're certainly starting to talk about here on, on this network a lot, just to expose people to the, the plan that the Heritage Foundation and a whole bunch of far-right 
Christian nationalist advocacy groups have have written. And, you know, people have put their name to this. It's not a secret. It's a 900-page document that says that they're going to train up thousands of people, Trump loyalists, and have them standing by so that when he wins the presidency, then they will go into these civil service roles and fulfill the the job that he couldn't quite achieve the first time around because there were, you know, people with a moral compass in some, in some of these positions. Just explain to me, because, you know, for me, the hypocrisy is that, you know, we don't, we don't want you to, um, it's like preventing other people from practicing their religion or, or, or expressing themselves in the LGBTQ plus community or whatever the, the kind of toxic issue is that they manage to find. But at the same time, we'll indoctrinate you into this far right Christian nationalist version of America that we have planned for you. So it, it's, it's their way or the highway. And I, and I, and, and that is my concern is is that there is a double standard here it's it it is quite frightening because i think for many americans christian nationalism as a religious movement might be something they agree with disagree with uh, but many people are insufficiently frightened could we try and define it for people who don't really know what it is? Because I think that's probably quite important at this stage because well, we talk about it a lot. But sure. for you as a, as a minister, what is the difference between your communal garden Christian <laughs> versus the, the, the extreme right? Right. Uh, so if you believe that you, that America, um, is a Christian nation and it should reflect Christianity in the judiciary, in the legislature, in the federal executive, as in the presidency. Then the values of Christianity should be reflected in federal policy to a much greater extent than we have ever seen. And that has profound implications for how you live your life. Not merely as an atheist, an agnostic, a non-Christian nationalist, a Muslim, a Jew, um, a non-Christian nationalist Christian, but across the board. And what I mean by that is this. There's so many ways in which we as Americans assume that we're free to believe whatever we believe. And we are free to act on those beliefs as long as they don't violate um, common notions of decency or, or, or laws. Christian nationalism represents a massive threat, particularly as the Heritage Society is organizing around this set of core beliefs and principles. Meaning, if you can imagine showing up uh, to local passport office and you're choosing to visit some country that practices a religion that's not in the main practice to the degree Christianity is practiced here, maybe the person at the passport office declines your passport to visit a country where Islam is in the majority, where Judaism is in the majority, or we deem this country not to be a morally fit place to visit. Uh, if you could imagine a federal bureaucracy where literally the people who are responsible for enforcing the nation's laws, the United States Justice Department, where I once worked and prosecuted civil rights cases, maybe you have people who are in non-political appointee positions, who are literally doing their work according to their particular values. So where we have a person who is victimized by an LGBT, as a consequence of an LGBT hate crime, and you have someone who, who believes that the homosexual lifestyle is, is morally wrong, and therefore we don't prosecute those kinds of crimes. I mean, that's just unimaginable. But it is conceivable and even predictable 
if we allow this philosophy to be effectuated in terms of the federal bureaucracy. I mean, this is absolutely frightening. Let me, let me, let me give you an example. When I worked in the United States Justice Department, we were responsible for going after people engaged in discrimination based on religion, all kinds of religion. So if you're a Christian, you discriminate against Jews uh, in terms of housing, we go after you. Uh, if you're a Christian, a uh, Muslim discriminating against Christians, we went after you. Uh, we prosecuted people who engaged in anti-Semitism, anti-Black racism, uh, hate crimes. The point being here is you want your government not to pick and choose when it comes to religion. And I just don't think people fully appreciate the degree to which you want people in government who are not particularly ideological uh, in these front line, these main line positions. Now, as last, last example I'll give you. When I was a, when I was a baby lawyer, and, and here's why I, I think it's, 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 it's important for us not to stereotype. I brought a case once on behalf of one of the nation's largest Southern Baptist churches, pretty conservative church, where they decided to provide housing for people with HIV AIDS. The United States Justice Department didn't, we didn't focus on their religion. We just focused on the fact that there were people in the city of Houston at that time that tried to prevent a church from providing housing for people with AIDS because some people thought uh, some of the people with AIDS might be poor, they might be homeless, or they might be gay. We brought that lawsuit. And we uh, precipitated a settlement for a religiously conservative group of people who also happen to be black, who made, many of whom vote Democrat. My point being is we don't know, we, we can't sort people based upon uh, their religion. And it's even hard to predict how people behave based upon how they classify themselves. The Heritage Society's plan is extraordinarily dangerous. We don't want people in government um, acting like our Congress, right? When I go to the passport office, I want somebody to check my birth certificate and help me to get to where I need to go. When I go to the DMV, I want my license. When I go to uh, the Department of Transportation, I want some help to make sure my pot the potholes are filled on my interstate highways. This is a dangerous, dangerous, dangerous uh, place. But especially if it filters down to the police, because, mm -hmm. you know, th that is my concern, is, is that, you know, th this kind of, I, I think this about um, Derek Chauvin, you know, he, he executed George Floyd on video mm -hmm. and thought he could get away with it because... Donald Trump was the president. That's right. Because he knew that the guy at the top had his back. Mm -hmm. Because he knew that Trump had suggested, oh, you know, when you put people, you put That's criminals right. in the back of the police car, don't worry about them banging their head. Just, you know, gave them license to rough people up a little bit. That's right. This is my concern, is that, is that this far-right Christian nationalism that, is, that will become embedded in the civil service will extend down to the foot soldiers, the police officers, the fire service, and, and, and the people that we rely on to support us, save us, rescue us, and be there for us, no matter what our race or, or religion. That's right. You know, is one thing I've, I have observed among those in the healthcare profession. You talk to a great many doctors, when people come into the OR, I mean, come into the OR or the emergency room, they spend no time asking people about their religion, except to the extent it could impact their health. They don't really don't care about how you vote uh, unless it has some impact or bearing on your health. That is the kind of ethos that you have to have in the civil service, where your job is to be concerned about delivering a service for American citizens. I can tell you, um, I've been the main voted Democrat, but when I was an attorney with the United States Justice Department, you first of all, you take an oath, right? 
you take an oath, you carry a badge. You're taught that your job is to serve the United States. Let me put this way. So, Anthony, when you sign a, a complaint, a legal document filing a lawsuit, it would say Anthony Davis on behalf of the United States of America. We need civil servants who understand when you sign up to serve your country through government, you are literally doing so on behalf of the United States of America. Now, it sounds patriotic. It sounds quaint. It sounds a little old fashioned. But a lot of people actually believe that. Yeah. Well, people like people like Brad Raffensperger, for example. Right. You know, in, 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 in Georgia, who was mm-hmm. whose job it was to That's know, right. count, count, count the votes. I mean, he as a Republican uh-huh. recognized that in that moment he had an oath of office that he was prepared to uphold. That's and right. unlike unlike the president that same week. Yeah, let me let me let me put it this way. It's um it's inter- it's interesting. We have to remind people that the Republican Party and Democratic Party that we now have, we've not always had. Right? Right? We, we, there were people called in this country called Whigs. And folks who are a member of the uh do nothing party, right? So we, we we've not always been in this binary box that we're in today. And as a consequence, our allegiance should not be to the Heritage Society, the Cato Society, the Congressional Black Caucus, or anything else above, right, our allegiance, our loyalty to our country. I mean, you know, one of the things that I'm struck by, I I recall when I was a little boy growing up in South Carolina, I attended a, a Catholic school, and the nuns would make us stand out on a cold morning outside. And pledge allegiance to the flag outside, not in the classroom. They thought that this was so important that we had to begin our day. And what was interesting, we started our day with the Pledge of Allegiance, not Hail Mary, not the Lord's Prayer, but literally pledging allegiance to the flag. Now, I'm not putting the flag above the Lord or, or anybody else, but when I, I am saying it, it does speak to this notion that we are committed to the Republic, committed to our country, more so than these political divisions, uh, which are just extraordinarily dangerous, not only for our country, but, our, but as, as we lifted up in this conversation, literally our, our faiths and our, and, and our uh, religious traditions. And I, and I think the Heritage Society, I mean, here's a, here's a part of that I'm really concerned about is the degree to which religious bodies are becoming just another interest group. Right. So if we think about Dr. King standing on the mall during the civil rights movement, during the march on Washington, where he literally cites the Declaration of Independence, he invokes the national anthem, he calls to mind the founding fathers standing in front of the Lincoln Memorial invoking Thomas Jefferson. He's doing so as a religious figure, using his religious values help people understand their national commitments. Not saying we need a theocracy, but if we're going to have a democracy, this is what the democracy should do. What we have in the present moment is we flip that. We're using democracy to reaffirm religious values as opposed to literally the religious people standing flat-footed in their respective traditions and helping everybody else understand how to be better citizens as a consequence of being better people. It's unfortunate that people don't or have never had to give the any thought to who the state is. Trump refers to the deep state and, you know, we're going to root out the deep state and we're going to replace, you know, with 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 loyalists. But unfortunately, you know, the, the, the state, because we might think of the IRS, for example, you know, uh-huh. coming and taking money off, off, off of us that we can't afford. Uh-huh. There is in everybody a sense that, oh, you know, the state is too big. It's too inflated. You don't have yeah. to be a conservative to have that view. Right. So it is a little bit of a gray area. But what <laughs> Donald Trump has done is he has weaponized that language and, and created fear of the deep state. And actually, the deep state is just the government. 
Mm-hmm. It is government workers. Mm-hmm. It is people that are have been lifelong government workers who who you know go to a central office every day mm-hmm. and, and they might be black or white or Christian or Muslim. It's irrelevant because they have a job. They have a, a civil, civic duty. Right. Trump really can't imagine having a civic duty. He's not a public servant. So he doesn't really have empathy for that. And a lot of this has come from Steve Bannon, the yeah. idea of, well, you know, really crushing the administrative state. And he's spoken very publicly about the plan. Is there a danger that maybe we have underestimated how easy it is to to, to weaponize this, yeah, this department? Right. Yeah. Because, you know, Trump talks about the judiciary, about about yeah, yeah. the Attorney General. Yeah. Merrick Garland talks about, you know, the Department of Justice as if it is some, you know, he claims Joe Biden is the one that is putting him in, in, in court, that all these legal issues are Joe Biden's doing. That's right. So the, the language is very important here, isn't it? And, the and, la- and maybe language. we need to mm-hmm. think more about who the state is made up of. That's right. That's right. Well, here we have a, a, a tension between size and existence. So if we go back to Grover Norquist, who said that essentially the conservatives' aspiration should be to shrink government to such a size that you can kill it in a bathtub or choke it to death in a bathtub, as he graphically put it. There, in under Ronald Reagan and that earlier generation of conservatives, the notion was that government was too big. They were suspicious of large government, but not necessarily government categorically speaking. We've had this undergone as a country, at least in some quarters of the country, kind of philosophical evolution where we're not merely questioning the size of government, but the existence of government itself. And not only that, but we question the intention and purpose of government. And so we've literally weaponized, not really size, but the existence of government. Yeah. And when you uh, move from size to existence and rapid in conspiracy theories, it is all the more toxic and all the more dangerous. But let us know this. Americans are capable of making finer distinctions. So, for example, many people dr- distrust big pharma, Right. They distrust uh, large uh, health entities uh, in terms of insurance companies. They, on the other hand, trust their doctors, trust their nurses, trust healthcare professionals. When we look at trust, doctors, uh, doctors, nurses, among the most trusted people in society, even as people are deeply suspicious, deeply apprehensive about large uh, medical facilities in the healthcare system more broadly. I think in this moment, our challenge must be help people think about, yes, the size of government, the purpose of government, what government actually does without distrusting the people themselves. And let's, let, last historical point here. Let's go back to when Bill Clinton was president he often used the term bureaucrats um, in terms of speaking about the federal government until the Oklahoma City bombing. When, when white nationalists blow up a federal building, government building, and the children were killed, adults were killed, civil servants were killed, he said his words, that he refused to describe the government as a, as a group of faceless, nameless, identity-less individuals as opposed to people. Yeah. Now, that should suggest to us that in the present moment the danger in literally uh, reducing the people who serve us to people who are not merely like uh, the, the blank faces of the deep state, but who are literally uh, our fellow citizens who are engaged in service. And the last point I'll make here is when we talk about the, the, 
the, the deep state, there's a level of conspiracy and distrust and weaponization phrases like that. It's just absolutely frightening to me. Like, absolutely frightening. When in fact, what these people are often talking about is not necessarily deep state. They're talking about your state. Yeah. As in a state being run by people we don't like and that we don't trust uh, and we want out of power. Because frankly, this, the government that the former president describes is deeper, bigger, more powerful, more threatening than anything any of the liberals have cooked up with. Even if you, t if you take the conservatives' critique at their word. Right? Like, let me put it this way. You don't, you don't have too many progressives talking about turning the DOJ into their private army of vengeance. Right? Like, this, like, this is off the Richter scale. So, yeah, no, this is not, uh, you know, this, this, this is a very serious moment and, and a dangerous moment. The, the fear, the faux outrage, which is a theme of the MAGA Republicans, isn't it? This, you know, because Trump has said multiple times recently, they're not after me, they're after you. I'm just, I'm just standing in their way. He's trying to present himself as a martyr so that if, you know, the law does eventually catch up with him, yes, he can kind of go down as a, as, a, as a martyr and even remain on the ballot because of it. I mean, that, I mean that's actually probably the most kind of bib biblical thing the guy's ever done to kind of present himself in this way. But they are looking to him now as a kind of messiah character. You know, that there are religious people gathering around, putting their hands on him as if he is <laughs> sacred. Yes, yes. And wanting to be blessed by him. So it's it's gone from him just being like the host of The Apprentice who got lucky in an election one year to him creating this messiah complex and, and, and people buying into it and yes. believing that it is God's choosing yes. that Donald Trump is carrying the, the weight of the nation and has given up his private life for this very public role. A, a, a lot of people are into that story. A, a lot of people are into it in, in a way that is formal, scriptural, and theological. So, for example, when President Trump was in office, it was not uncommon to have people refer to him as King Cyrus. In the, you know, in the, in the scriptures, a, a king who was not a paragon of virtue but it ended up being a uh, salvific savior-like figure for, for the Jewish people. And even when President Trump visited Israel, there were people who referred to him as, as, as King Cyrus. So the point being here is that it's quite dangerous in that th these aren't offhand comments that random people were making, but serious people, religiously respected people, who are describing him and wrapping him in a kind of scriptural cloak. Yes. Um, that, frankly, I think for most serious students of scripture, violates the text. Now, having said that, and having recognized the potential harm, that I think the issue then becomes, well, what do we do? And I think one of the things that's, I think, incumbent upon religious people from across the spectrum, is to simply ask the question, is your description of, of uh, the foreign president more dangerous for you than it is a benefit to him? And I think many folks have not given it much thought. Here's what I mean. If we look at evangelicals who tend to often skew older, and we look at young people in this country, they're not buying that religious line in the same way. This is not helping them, right? Point one. Point two, I think it's, I think it's in, in, in important to appreciate that most evangelicals know the scripture that says, you know not the time, you know not the day nor the hour when the Son of Man cometh. 
Now, I, you know, I, I know it's not often when, when you show that people quote scripture like this, but since you bring it up, it is considered a kind of apostasy, a kind of heresy for Christians to run around and say, Anthony Davis just arrived in the clouds. He must be our Messiah. We don't do that, right? What we have going on here is this very act of exalting this political figure is in and of itself, right? A kind of religious travesty. And so I don't get into debates with people in terms of saying, you know, um, you know, your religion must mean you should go my way or, or, or another way. I'd simply challenge my, some of my, my, my fellow uh, believers, examine the scriptures you quote, right? Because if you do, it, you cannot easily anoint and crown and robe this guy as your as, as as your savior, based upon what it is that you what you say, what you quote, and what you preach. We have to take a, another quick break, but I, I want to come back and talk about what Ron DeSantis is taking back to Florida after his disaster on the national stage. Back in just a moment. Are you self-conscious about your smile due to stains? Are your teeth aging you? Food and drink are known to stain teeth. Coffee, wine, they stain over time. So what can you do to brighten your smile? Well, you should give Smile Actives a try. Smile Actives is safe, effective, easy to use, and will keep you smiling proudly. I personally have been to a dentist and had a teeth whitening treatment. It was painful. It was uncomfortable and it was not a experience that I would want to repeat. Well, simply add Smile Active's Pro Whitening Gel to your regular toothpaste. Do it at home. It's been formulated with PolyClean technology to boost stain removal and deliver active whitening ingredients into teeth's grooves to get better whitening. People will start commenting on your whiter, brighter smile in just days. Smile Active's is the whitening boost your favorite toothpaste needs to give you the smile you deserve. Visit smileactives.com slash weekend today to receive a special buy one, get one free offer with auto delivery plus shipping and handling. That's smileactives.com slash weekend. Terms and conditions apply. See site for details. Did you know Fast Growing Trees is the biggest online nursery in the U.S. with more than 10,000 different types of plants and over 2 million happy customers? You can grow lemon, avocado, olive or fig trees inside your home on top of the wide variety of houseplants available. Fast Growing Trees makes it easy to order online and your plants are shipped directly to your door in one to two days. And along with their 30-day Alive and Thrive guarantee, they offer free plant consultation forever. I've received recently a lemon tree, an avocado tree and a fiddle fig. And I mean, it looks like a veritable forest on my deck right now. For a limited time only, not only can you buy one, get one free on their website, but listeners to our show get an additional 15% off when using the code WEEKEND at checkout. That's an additional 15% off at fastgrowingtrees.com using the code WEEKEND at checkout. Fastgrowingtrees.com, code WEEKEND. Offer is valid for a limited time. Tell them we sent you. We're back on The Weekend Show with Professor Cornell William Brooks. Uh, let's talk for a moment about someone who we thought we'd heard the last of, and that is the uh, Governor Ron DeSantis of Florida. Uh, there was a story out a couple of days ago that said Florida school kids may have to study the threat of communism in the U.S. These are new Republican bills to go to Ron DeSantis' desk, who's rallied against indoctrination of students by liberal elites. We know he picked a fight with Disney, and you know that didn't didn't end particularly well. But there is this idea we touched on it a little bit earlier okay. that your indoctrination your indoctrination is bad, but my indoctrination is good. I mean, DeSantis obviously we saw the kind of rise and fall of him. He tried to present very far right Christian nationalist uh, policies. But he did it with a straight face because he's not an entertainer. He's not a he's not a communicator or a humorist. And so people didn't buy it. The problem with Donald Trump is when he says these things, 
he he does it with the showbiz and so yeah. people are like yeah okay i'll take that even though it's an authoritarian policy i'm kind mm -hmm. of i can digest it mm -hmm. so DeSantis failed on the national stage as much of us predicted that he would mm -hmm. but now he's obviously gone back to florida and the fear is that he is going to ramp up some of these extremist policies upon the citizens of florida mm -hmm. where he failed nationally he will not fail uh, 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 locally the the hypocrisy but also again this push for religion in what is supposed to be a, a non-religious uh state mm -hmm. environment is 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 very much ramping up not just florida we should say That's so right. many of the of the gop controlled states now are starting and, and with with a woman's right to choose being absolutely at the at the heart of this uh we're seeing an increasing level of authoritarianism, men wanting to control women, invariably, mm -hmm. at state level. So I'll give you, start with a, a personal example. A few weeks ago for Martin Luther King Day, I had the opportunity and occasion to speak at a college in Florida. This was after Governor DeSantis banned diversity, equity, and inclusion offices on college campuses. This, of course, was succeeded, followed by um, their, in fact, banning sociology. Again, in response to a religious agenda. The thing that's frightening is that it's not merely indoctrination of new scripted ideas, ideologically scripted ideas. It's also a kind of de-education with respect to ideas, subjects, histories, they have long been respected as a part of the, of the educational canon. So here we have legislators literally determining what's good for our children and our college students to learn. Now, it's not like these folks were convening wise minds, the best of the best, to figure out what's on the cutting edge of history or sociology or, or um political science. This is like literally people responding to political agendas and religious agendas and dictating what should be taught. Now, the levels of hypocrisy here are simply astounding. Where we have the governor of Florida, who, like me, is a graduate of Yale. Um, he's also a graduate of Harvard. To the best of my knowledge and the best of my research, he has not disclaimed his degrees. So how is it that he's prescribing for other people's children that which was not good enough for him? So like, he didn't attend schools with this limited curriculum. He didn't attend schools where they were literally trying to operate under a, a kind of counsel of the ignorant. This is just, this is just I mean, like absolute Madness. So it's even worse than indoctrination because indoctrination is like, let us force feed you the ideas we want you to have, as opposed to let us literally take out of your head, take out of your education ideas we don't want you to have. This is the same state, right, where you have book bans all over the place. How is it that literally you can have people calling into question whether or not you should study uh, the diary of Anne Frank or read the books of Toni Morrison or the essays of James Baldwin. How is it that you can have Florida, Florida, to, you know, that was considered the sunshine state, the kind of, I mean, the state where everyone wanted to move and they had a, you know, a, a great school system, it was a pretty good school system and a system of higher education. Like who in their right mind? And I'm reflecting what I heard from professors in Florida. Who in their right mind would want to go to Florida to teach in this moment? 
It's like literally the wane of the ignorant. It's uh, just, just the, the idea that's been bought by people who who pay attention to the governor of Florida, Florida, for example, that if you were to read a, an LGBTQ plus book, that it might make you gay. That that you you know you you will your physiology your f- physiology will change because you've read this book. That it, it's not just you know lacking any kind of thought, but it, it's just dumb. Oh, and it, I, I feel I feel like people have given up any notion of critical thinking, and they are looking to people like DeSantis and to people like Donald Trump. And even Tucker Carlson, who you know this week was hanging out with Vladimir Putin, yes, for like for like you know if these guys say it, then that's good enough for me. Mm-hmm. That is the society falling foul of authoritarianism, accepting it. You know, it's like I don't need to think critically, I don't need to do any of the work myself. If they say that books are bad, then they must be bad such a valuable component is being removed mm-hmm. the ability to, to think to think for oneself and you know it is so contrary to so much of what is good in american history right so so meaning yeah um america's is this long running messy tale of a fight over ideas right you know we we uh, the abolitionists Basically, you know, well before social media publishing, you know, slave narratives because they want people to be free. Um, we have the slave masters publishing slave Bibles where anything that would encourage people to seek freedom has been ripped out. But of course, enslaved people teaching themselves to read and finding their own literature and inspiring themselves. And this whole, like, I, I, I just love this notion that somehow if you re- read a book containing any mention of homosexuality, this would make you gay. Well, the thing is, you know, I grew up in a very religiously traditional household where we read the Bible. Well, the, the Bible is replete with really colorful stories, including stories of gay sex. Right? It's called Sodom and Gomorrah, but there are others. And so this whole notion that our children's minds will be corrupted by what they read as opposed to what they're taught, what they're given context for, what they are um, um, engaged in, that makes the difference. Right? So the, so the thing is, we want, our, we want our children, we want our students to reach challenging ideas, thoughtful ideas, and to grow as a consequence as opposed to being spoon-fed anybody's ideas, right? And so, you know, and what's so shocking here, Anthony, is the people who engaged in this enterprise know better. Do you really think uh, Governor DeSantis was running around the campus of Harvard and Yale Declining to read books because the ideas were too dangerous. He's read books that he's barring other people from reading. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Right? Yeah. You could not even propose in any of the institutions he went to where he went to school, you couldn't even propose this kind of nonsense. It's, I mean it's ridiculous. And the thing is, it's intellectually and morally insulting. Because what he's essentially saying is. I'm going to treat the citizens in Florida like some ignorant hayseeds. Well, I'm from the South, grew up in the South. And the idea of a Harvard, Yale educated governor telling us what's too hard for us to read is insulting in the extreme. Right. And this is the same same state. He may not appreciate this. Where we have. uh the Bethune-Cookman College, right? And Mary McLeod Bethune literally creates a college on pennies. First, the first black woman to be a presidential advisor. This woman comes from Florida. 
So you have this intellectually trained, ignoramus acting governor in the same state as Mary McLeod Bethune trying to convince the people not to read it. Are you serious? I mean, this is ridiculous. In addition to the book banning and to the, you know, the claim that communists need to be rooted out. I mean, it's... <laughs> right, the communists, like... I know, I know. It's, I, the fact that I'm even having to say this stuff out loud in this year is, is remarkable. But there's also this whitewashing of history now. Yeah. Huh? Where some of the language is that, well, the, the white slave owners, they gave these slaves opportunities. And that, you know, if it wasn't for the, if it wasn't for the white slave owners, then, you know, the, the, the slaves would never have learned skills. This is now what we're starting to hear from, from these people. Mm -hmm. J just talk to me about the, how that kind of impacts the, the story of black America. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would argue that this whitewashing of American history impacts the story of certainly black Americans, but the story of America more broadly. How so? To the extent that we have a state trying to embed into the educational curriculum um, the lost cause version of Confederate history, that, that the Confederates in the South lost this the Civil War as a consequence of the, the moral duplicity, hypocrisy of the Northerners, that they were mistreated, that the slaves were well-treated, and that uh, not only were they well-treated, they should be grateful yes. having been treated so well. Now, he, here's, here's why this really disturbs the whole of the country. It literally whitewashes and homogenizes the abolitionist history. It whitewashes and homogenizes literally some of the most powerful tools for democracy. We just had a Supreme Court case where they were debating the meaning of the 14th Amendment as a bulwark, as a protection of our democracy. Well, how did the 14th Amendment come into being? The 14th Amendment literally granted citizenship to people who were formerly enslaved. So what was designed to protect black people, give black people citizenship, is also now being invoked to protect the democracy. So to the extent that these people whitewash, homogenize, uh, literally obliterate American history, they're not obliterating their history, meaning black people's history. They're literally obliterating, taking, stealing, profaning our history, right? So in, so in other words, this, the, the 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment, the 13th Amendment, these are the amendments that protect all of us. So when we talk about everyone, everyone being uh, having uh, a right to due, pro due process of law, or equal protection under the law. We don't refer to those as black rights. We refer to those as American rights. And so literally to the extent that you have a governor who is a lawyer, let me note that. Yes. He is a lawyer. For him to participate in this intellectual duplicity is just gobsmacked. It's just mind blowing to me. He knows. He but knows. It, it is literally a theft of, I, I think, the honor due to the whole country. Because at, at the end of the day, it really, it really comes down to, this is hard-fought, bloody American history, right? So in, in other words, you know, I, I once walked from Selma to Washington, D.C., a thousand miles. I walked past Confederate Cemeteries. I visited Confederate cemeteries and cemeteries of Union soldiers and um, uh, memorials to American vets. Anytime we have people who want to like literally cut and paste American history, you're not just cut and pasting American history, you're cutting and pasting American heroes, 
American heroines, American veterans, uh, Americans who literally sacrifice, sacrifice. And this is what I, I just, you know, I, I confess, I just find incredibly insulting, galling, right? You know, and they, let, let me put this way. Um, my dad was a military officer. My brother was part of the 82nd Airborne. Plenty of veterans in my family, including some who fought in the Civil War, right? So one of my great-great-grandfathers, Jake Wineglass, fought in the Civil War, had to fight for his pension. To have their history corrupted by Ron DeSantis? Are you serious? Insulting. Absolutely insulting. But it's not only insulting to me as an individual, it's insulting to the country as a whole, and most particularly the citizens um, in Florida. And again, it's not like the governor doesn't know better. He knows better. Finally, what would a second Trump presidency mean <laughs> for, for, for you and uh, the people that you work with and the people that you know? How what what would the effect be? Because you know everybody has their own version of 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 how the first Trump presidency made them feel. What would a, what would a second one do for you? Former President Trump represents a literal, as in physical, threat to certainly people of color, um, black people, Latino people, um, Asian people members of the LGBTQ community, migrants, refugees. And I say that because we saw under his initial term, his first term, a vicious vectoring upward of hate crime across all categories. We saw a correlation of hate crime with where he campaigned. And so we have not yet recovered from that. Literally hate crime has gone up and stayed up and in recent months gone up even further. So if there is a second turn, given the way he has campaigned and is campaigning, we can expect not more of the same, but worse of the same. And so this is a real concern in terms of the physical well-being and security of people of color in this country. But we can also count on the former president administering or not administering the nation's civil rights laws in ways that literally imperil people, imperil not only their rights, but their physical security. Lastly, if we think about reproductive rights as reproductive health, we can expect women to have even less access to reproductive health than they had before, prior to the support Supreme Court's ruling in Dobbs, which means that more women will die in childbirth, more women will die as a consequence of miscarriages, more women, more women will be prosecuted as a consequence of miscarriages. So my point being is the prospect of a second Trump term literally represents not merely a paper-thin constitutional threat, but a real physical threat to large numbers of Americans. Lastly, for those who are concerned about the existence of this democracy and the continued existence of this democracy, we need to be very, very, very clear. Anybody who supports voter suppression against them is, is against democracy for all of us. Because you cannot suppress their votes without being worried about the right to vote for everyone. And as I like to remind people, whenever you see racial voter suppression, you often see generational voter suppression. Yes. Voter suppression against black and brown people also represents voter suppression against young people. And that means all kinds of young people. So there will be threats to our democracy, threats to the right to vote. There will be threats with respect to the way government acts, the way government serves, the way uh, 
government delivers services. And so the point being here is the election of Donald Trump would be, frankly, catastrophic. And I want to be very, very clear here. One need not be a political alarmist. One need not engage in his historical histrionics to be absolutely frightened by the prospect of the second Donald Trump uh, presidency return. This is, um, this is serious, and it's not something that we need to be frightened of, but, but something we need to be vigilant about. And that simply means that we have to vote. We have to vote in significant numbers. And we need to do more than just elect somebody other than Donald Trump. We have to do more than just elect Joe Biden. We need a strengthened Voting Rights Act. We need the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Yes. We need to engage in a massive investment in our democracy infrastructure. What I mean by that is making it easier to vote. We got to get rid of the electoral college. That is a little governance anachronism. Um, we've got to shore up the norms of our democracy. We've gotten too used to disinformation. We've gotten too used to being spoon fed um, political pablum that disserves our ability to, to literally protect the democracy that we were gifted um, by our forebears. And so, yes, second term of Donald Trump, dangerous, but not anything we need to be fearful of, but we got to be vigilant against. Okay. Yes, it, it does seem there's only one candidate that is advocating for democracy. And whether you like Joe Biden or not, he's, he's, he's the guy who is, is offering that. Well, let me, let me put it this way. I think Joe Biden is absolutely right. He says, don't judge him by uh, the almighty, judge him by the alternative. Yes. And by any objective standard, he has been an effective, successful president in terms of a legislative agenda. I would hope that even if you think that there's somebody out there as a political possibility after Joe Biden who would be better than Joe Biden, great. But right now, it appears that you have a choice between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. And at the very least, you should be aware of what is not good for democracy. And better than that, he is by far the better candidate. Okay. Thank you, Professor Thank Cornell you. William Brooks. Uh, a pleasure. Pleasure. It's always good to be with you. I'm Anthony Davis. Don't forget to support me and independent journalism at patreon.com slash five minute news. You can become a member of the five minute news YouTube channel. And don't forget the five minute news podcast that you can subscribe to and download. Join me next week with a brand new special guest and more factual news to discuss on the 5-Minute News weekend show with Midas Touch.